Good afternoon, everyone. This is Katie Otto, Director of Communications at Juvenile Law Center, um, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our Children's Rights 101 for Reporters uh, webinar and conference call. Um, today, uh, we'll be hearing from Sue Mangold, CEO of Juvenile Law Center, and Marsha Levick, co-founder and chief legal officer of Juvenile Law Center. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. I will be running the tech support. Uh, so if you have any questions or you're having uh, technical issues, please chat them uh, into the box where uh, it provides for the questions option or the chat option. I'll monitor both. Um, and I'll be happy to help uh, as we go through the conversation. Um, so, without further ado, thank you so much for your time, and I will turn it over to uh, Sue and Marsha. Hi, thanks. This is Sue Mangold, and I'm here with Marsha Levick, and we will be going sort of back and forth uh, during this uh, preliminary part of the webinar to offer our thoughts around children's rights, uh, and then we'll both work together here to answer your questions. And we've tried to structure this so that there will be plenty of time uh, to answer your questions so that we're sure that we, um, you know, uh, leave you with the information that you need going forward. So we thought it might be helpful just to give a few minutes on the historic origins of children's rights in the United States before we bring it all the way through to sort of some of the emerging issues today. And I guess the main points I wanted to make were twofold. One is that there's always been a tension between a child's right to protection and a child's right to empowerment. And so as we think about children's rights in the United States, sometimes there are demands on us um, to protect them in special ways uh, that the state does not owe a duty to adults. And sometimes it's a right to empower the child and give them rights to make their own decisions or to at least participate in some way um, despite the fact that they're not yet um, adults. And so we'll be talking about that sort of tension and that interrelationship as we talk today. The second thing I wanted to mention uh, just to get us started is that this discussion of children's rights and this balance between protection and empowerment dates back to the earliest days of, um, from the colonies some of the first laws that came over from England were the Body of Liberties in 1640. And the Body of Liberties gave children a right to petition when they suffered um, unnaturally severe punishment. And so that may sound very arcane, but what's kind of important is that at that time in England and throughout the rest of the world, children neither had the right to petition nor had the right against any level of punishment that might be put upon them by a parent or by someone to whom they'd been apprenticed. But in the new world, if you will, because each person was so valuable to the corporate interests, as we might say in modern times, that sent them over here, the tobaccos, the you know, industry in England that funded some of the ships, the cotton industry, et cetera, that they actually sent laws over that would protect the well-being of children in a way that they were not at that time protected in England. And so the Body of Liberties from the very earliest times uh, in 1640 set up both the child's right to a petition, which is sort of an empowerment right, and their right to protection based on that petition, um, based on what was called unnaturally severe uh, punishment. So that's, you know, way back when, maybe not relevant to today's uh, media reporting, but I think it's just helpful to recognize this foundation. Um, through the 1800s and the progressive era, we saw a series of court cases that were trying, in, in, at the state level, that were trying to define uh, when children would have a right to protection um, or would have a right to petition or otherwise exercise rights as an independent individual. Um, but it's not until a series of su Supreme Court cases uh, beginning in the 1920s that children's rights begin to be articulated in a way that has precedential value across a variety of systems. And so you may hear about um, Meyer and, and Pierce and Prince and Yoder these are sort of famous cases, none of which had a child as a party. 
And so, for instance, the Meyer case dealt uh, with a law um, that said that only English could be used to teach the basic courses in school. And so a teacher teaching uh, in German at a Lutheran school was prosecuted. And the question of the children's rights um, to education was raised. And so it was through these cases that a definition of parental rights to raise children as uh, parental rights to raise children as they see fit and children's rights to the for the state to state to step in um, when their health and safety was at risk began to be introduced. And of course, I can speak more about those um, if anyone has any question, but I don't want to belabor this um, historic, uh, you know, aspect of things because I know we want to get to the more modern. Um, and and uh, Marsh is going to speak for a bit and then it will come back to me to talk about some child welfare legislation that brings us more up to the modern notion of children's rights. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to, to Marsha. Hi, and welcome. I'm glad to be talking with you all uh, today. So I'm Marsha Levick. I'm the chief legal officer here at Juvenile Law Center, and I was a co-founder of the center back in 1975. And I think that date's important because at the time that we started Juvenile Law Center, we were a group of recently graduated lawyers who had really learned about the notion of civil rights from the civil rights era um, that obviously was, was very much in play throughout the 1960s and early 1970s. And we really came to think about children's rights as being an aspect of the civil rights community and the civil rights movement. And I mentioned that because as we started our work here, we were very much interested in elevating children's autonomy and children's voice. And we believed that our approach to advocacy should really focus on our role as counsel for children in the courtroom, uh, for children in administrative proceedings, that we were their voice, but that the emphasis was really on ensuring that children's voices were heard, that they had a say in what happened to them and frankly, very much thinking about them as adults, which is kind of interesting as, as we will talk more about how our thinking and the application of laws and our constitution to children has evolved over the last four decades. But in the beginning, we very much thought it was about elevating children's rights to almost an equivalency with adult rights and really focusing, as I said, on autonomy and agency. What's happened over the last several decades is that while there were many wins for children, uh, particularly children who were involved in the justice system during the 1970s and early 80s, the US Supreme Court was very favorable in critiquing and striking down abusive conditions, both in prisons and in juvenile correctional facilities. There was a, a willingness, I think, early on during that time period, again, to embrace this notion of autonomy. Reproductive rights cases were before the Supreme Court at this time, and the initial focus of those cases was to acknowledge that young girls had autonomy over their reproductive choices and that those choices could be exercised without the veto or intervention of a parent. But what happened is that as the Supreme Court frankly became more conservative, as legislatures became more conservative, the conversation shifted in how we thought about ways to give children agency. And that shift really moved from thinking about children's rights to thinking about children's needs. And so this, this rights versus needs dialogue is very much connected to the protection and empowerment conversation that Sue started us off with. Because we recognize that although there was to, to a certain degree some tension in thinking about how is it that we protect children while we also empower them to, to assert themselves and to ensure that their voices were heard, we also, frankly, somewhat as almost a matter of pragmatism and practicality and efficiency and effectiveness, we came to believe that if we started to articulate ways to improve children's lives by focusing on what we felt they needed to achieve those improvements, we could be faithful to the notion that children had rights that needed to be recognized and enforced, 
but using the language of needs and protection turned out to be more acceptable language. Um, again, because we were confronting both more conservative courts at the federal and state level, and also more conservative legislators and policymakers. And so the, the, our work here at Juvenile Law Center, our advocacy shifted from talking about children's needs to be treated differently, children's needs to be treated better, children's needs to be, pre be, to be treated more fairly. Ultimately, a lot of this was reflected through some of the neuroscience and social science that we're gonna talk about in a, in a couple of minutes. But I just wanted to, to, to provide this framework for our own advocacy here at Juvenile Law Center. We talk about children's rights all the time and we are an organization that is still dedicated to fighting for children's rights. But we have also found as advocates that we needed to be frankly somewhat nimble um, and, and creative in how we advocated for kids by occasionally changing our language from a very forceful view of children's rights to also being sure that we are mindful about what is it that children need to protect their rights um, and to ensure that they have uh, a level of equality that is also what we're very much concerned with in equity, but sometimes using this sort of parallel language of needs as well as rights at the same time. Yeah, and I'm gonna, this is Sue again, I'm gonna pick up from there um, and talk about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Again, this is by way of background because the, the sort of, what's the right word? Tragic, unbelievable news is that the United States is the only member of the UN at this point in time that has not ratified the convention. But the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, was uh, drafted here in New York at the UN and ratified in 1989 by the General Assembly. And uh, then President H.W. Bush um, declared the year of the child and there seemed to be great momentum behind this, but very quickly um, all kinds of conservative arguments against ratification by the United States um, came into play. And so when the convention was sent to the member nations or the member states of the UN for signature. It had the single swiftest um, signature um, uh, ratification of any UN document on the very first day, 61 nations signed. Um, but it wasn't until 1995 that President, so President Bush never signed it, but it wasn't until 1995 that President Clinton signed it. Um, but the Senate has never taken it up. So the US Senate has neither debated nor has it ever certainly ratified um, the UN Convention and it would need a two thirds vote. So some of the arguments against the convention here in the United States are sort of the familiar arguments that we hear um, that it would you know, elevate international law over, over domestic law, that it would elevate a, you know, federal law over state law, um, that it would uh, demand unfunded mandates by the states. And so for a whole variety of reasons, um, even though states can take reservations as to specific provisions, um, at the time there was a lot of argument because the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child um, uh, says that the death penalty for children is a violation of human rights. Um, so in 1989, when that was passed, the United States still had the death penalty for juveniles. But when that was eliminated um, by the Supreme Court in 2005, that was seen as another opportunity to consider the convention, but it has never um, been considered by the Senate. Um, and so I just mentioned it by way of background. It's the first comprehensive uh, UN um, document about children's rights. It covers civil, political, social, economic, and cultural rights. It is used um, persuasively in, by many of our um, you know, peer countries uh, in their local as well as their uh, national um, legal cases. It's part of the, the parlance in public policy debate, but it is sadly absent from, uh, from our uh, debate here in the United States. Uh, and this is Marsha again. I'm going to talk now a bit about really our, what is, I would say, the 21st century view of children's rights and the very significant role that neuroscience and social science has played 
in our developing children's rights jurisprudence. Before I get there, though, it's hard not to talk about the 1990s because that, in many respects, provided the landscape that I think our courts and legislatures have been confronting for the last 20 years. The 1990s was the year of the super predator when there was a prognostication that we would be facing a generation of violent teens who would be essentially terrorizing our communities. That term was coined by a researcher who by the time the 90s had concluded, had retracted his research, had admitted that he was actually wrong in the predictions that he had made. However, the harm was already done. And what happened over the course of the 90s across the country is that we saw numbers as high as 200,000 a year of children, uh, teenagers being charged, prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced in the adult criminal justice system. And the consequences of that is that these children were subjected to the identical sentencing options that were available to the adult criminal courts for adults. And beginning in the late 80s and 90s across the country, our whole justice system, both the juvenile and the criminal justice system, took a very, very sharp turn to the right. There had been a rise in violent crime in the early 80s, I'm sorry, in the early 90s, that caused uh, every state to rethink how it was punishing people. And so it really ushered in an era of mandatory sentencing, very long term years of sentences, and of course the death penalty, um, which up until 2005 was extended to children in a number of states as well. So against that backdrop, um, as we were seeing a very more, a very significant increase in punishment of children who were charged with and convicted of criminal offenses, the MacArthur Foundation in, in 1996 created a research network on adolescent development and juvenile justice. And the interest in developing that network um, was kind of their thesis was that they thought there might be relevant connections between the developmental characteristics of adolescents and teens and both culpability or blameworthiness for crimes and competency to waive certain rights. That research network began in earnest doing a number of studies and publishing a fair amount and a lot of that research began to be disseminated uh, into the public and became a part of the public discourse in the early 2000s simultaneously coincidentally serendipitously at the same time that the United States Supreme Court was open to revisiting certainly the death penalty um, and so in 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty could not be imposed on individuals who in the parlance of that time were characterized as mentally retarded, individuals who we would now characterize as intellectually disabled or challenged. And the blueprint that the court used in eliminating the death penalty for that category of individuals turned out to be very similar to the analysis of developmental traits of adolescents with respect to the, to the application of the death penalty to them as well. And essentially what the researchers were finding was that those characteristics, which included things that were obvious, an immaturity of judgment or bad, bad judgment that teenagers would exercise, a particularly greater susceptibility to negative peer pressure. Kids do everything in groups, Crime committed by teenagers is almost always committed in groups. Um, and so the influence of negative peers was determined to be a very significant factor in youth offending. And then of course, the fact that youth pass through adolescence. And so at the end of their teens into their early twenties, youth change. They are not the same individuals that they were during their teenage years and they make decisions differently and often look back as we all know and say, what was I thinking? Um, and in 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court was confronted with a challenge to the juvenile death penalty, a penalty that the court had upheld for 16 and 17 year olds only 15 years earlier in 1989. Relying on the research that was presented to it through a number of amici through the American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric, American Medical Association, 
the court really embraced the research and adopted these three core findings about immaturity of judgment, susceptibility to negative peer influences, and capacity for change and transformation and rehabilitation, and utilized those sort of three pillars of adolescence to uh, rule the death penalty unconstitutional. That decision was followed pretty quickly by a series of several other decisions through 2016 that eliminated life without parole for children who were convicted of non-homicide offenses, mandatory life without parole for children who were convicted of homicide crimes, and also articulated a very specific reasonable child standard for children subjected to police interrogation that essentially required law enforcement to think and treat children differently when interrogating them as potential suspects, suspects in criminal investigations. And the purpose of this reasonable child designation was to require law enforcement to recognize that children would perceive the, the notion of being in custody, which is the standard for Miranda warnings, which we all know about, um, the children would naturally perceive that differently because they would not think that they had the same ability or right or opportunity to walk away from the police, um, to understand that they did not need to comply uh, with a police stop, for example. And so these cases, um, which began with a focus on social science, concluded at the end of this, this sort of 10 year period with a not only an embracing of social science research, but also neuroscience. The neuroscience really backed up and complemented the social science by being able to connect brain development and the immature development of the frontal lobe of the brain where executive functions are housed to behavior and was able to essentially make this very important connection between uh, the, the slower rate of development of the frontal lobe of the brain with the kinds of immature behaviors that we saw in adolescence and that the development of the frontal lobe of the brain really continues into the early 20s. And that changed everything. Um, that science and the US Supreme Court's embrace and adoption of those scientific findings really ushered in a very different era from the super predator era, but in fact ushered in an era of kids are different. And so we went from thinking 40 years ago, kids are like adults, kids are the same, kids have autonomy, we want them to have rights, to understanding that the differences between children and adults, specifically with reference to their culpability for criminal offenses, their capacity to navigate the criminal justice system, to make decisions, to waive rights, really required a different degree of constitutional analysis, and in fact, one that yet again was more protective and more uh, generous toward children in both prohibiting extreme sentencing that could be imposed on children, changing the calculus about how we think about children in the adult criminal justice system, articulating a different theory about how we might think about conditions of confinement for children, how they might be affected by solitary confinement versus how adults might be affected, recognizing particular vulnerabilities that children categorically have because of their developing status as children and adolescents and changing how we applied our constitution to them. Yeah, and so early on, this is Sue again, I started by talking about some early cases in the 1920s and the 1940s um, that began to develop children's rights vis-a-vis -vis parental rights, and Marcia just talked to you about a series of Supreme Court cases um, that recognized the developmental science and made very important reforms in the justice system. Um, but the other a uh, place where we see the other origin of rights for children um, is in legislation. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the progression of legislation in the child welfare system, which both would help you understand sort of why we have the child welfare system that we have now, um, but also the importance of legislative mandates in establishing rights here in the United States. So back in the 1950s now, um, the state of Louisiana um, took uh, thousands of children off their public welfare rolls because they said they were living um, in unfit households. For the most part, that meant that they were um, black families uh, where the mother 
was living with a man to whom she was not married. And so they were taken off of the rolls. Um, and the reason was that the house was unfit. And so the Eisenhower administration was concerned about this and said by executive order, um, if you find a house to be unfit, then you either need to provide remedial services or you need to remove the child from the home and you can use the money that would have otherwise been paid to the home through public assistance to fund that out of home placement. And that executive order by President Eisenhower is the beginning of federal funding to localities for foster care. When the Kennedy administration came in in 1960s, um, then Secretary of um, Health, Education and Welfare, Ribicoff, um, uh, suggested the legislation and it was passed with no debate. And so what it did was put funding for foster care as an amendment to the public assistance law within the, the then uh, th that part of the Social Security Act. And so the mandate that kids needed to be placed if their home was unsafe only applied to those children on public assistance based on where the origin of this law. And that's important because from the very beginning, the mandates around the foster care system and the whole operation of the child welfare system was intimately tied to poverty and a determination of income eligibility. Uh, and that exists still today. So the first federal law that we see um, around child abuse and neglect, its interest is in 1974. It's interesting to follow this conversation from Marsha's discussion of the developmental science, because this was similarly sort of a medical initiative which prompted a major reform. And so the, um, uh, Dr. Henry Kemp it issued his very famous article, The Battered Child, in 1960-61 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it really created a revolution in the field that doctors could now diagnose um, child abuse, whereas before they might have improperly dismissed it um, based on a clinical explanation of parents or other caregivers as an accident. They were now being taught how to identify child abuse and neglect from the type of fracture or the type of burn. Um, and that level of detail is contained in Dr. Kemp's um, Battered Child article. The American Medical Association then took on sort of the cause of passing mandatory reporting laws that which would free doctors from what would otherwise be confidential uh, conversations with parents and allow them to report suspected child abuse and neglect based on this new medical knowledge. That then meant that you needed someone to receive these reports and do something about them. And so in 1974, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act is the first federal law that deals with child abuse and neglect. At that time, the Congress um, imagines that there could be up to 70,000 cases of child abuse and neglect in the United States. That's in 1974. By 1979, states are receiving over 1 million uh, reports of child abuse and neglect. And so they, uh, the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act for the first time places mandates on states, which means rights that children have if they are in the foster care system to a whole host of things. Um, and the, the key is to reasonable efforts to prevent placement. And so the, the, the law states that before um, the state, the locality can receive federal reimbursement for the foster care. The agency has to show that they made reasonable efforts to prevent placement or that it was not reasonable at the time to do so based on the level of the, of the harm that the, or the risk of harm that the child was under. So this is the beginning of mandates in federal law Ultimately, the Supreme Court actually decides later that these are not individual rights that children can exercise, but they are mandates on the states based on children's right to protection and the special needs of children. Um, and there's a whole series of federal legislation beginning in 1980 with the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act. It's the 40th anniversary this year of that law. Um, through a whole series of laws that talk about the, the kind of the um, Kids have a right to a guardian ad litem. Kids have a right to um, 
services to establish independence when they, once they hit 14 and 16. Kids now have um, uh, people, young people in the foster care system um, have a whole host of rights that come not from the courts, but from legislation. Um, each of the states then codifies this federal legislation because um, it's in exchange for federal reimbursement. So in other words, the federal law um, contains the mandates and the states have to follow the mandates to be eligible for federal reimbursement of up to well, but a little over, I don't know, some states it's between 50 and 80% of the cost of their foster care system. Um, and so all states adopt the mandates and they apply then based on state law to all children in the system, even though the federal law only applies to kids who are eligible, um, whose families are eligible for public assistance. Um, so I will stop there and hand it back over to Marcia to talk a little bit more about the justice system. And we're gonna conclude this part of our remarks, both Sue and I, by looking forward um, and talking about some of the things that we see coming down the road as we think about children's rights. And with respect to the justice system, everything that we are now talking about and the focus of our advocacy today is very much rooted in this kids are different frame and really building on the Supreme Court case law of the last 15 years that has, as I said, really articulated almost a, a very distinctive uh, youth jurisprudence under the Constitution that has applied not just the Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause, but also the Due Process Clause differently to kids than it does to adults. So this has opened up some interesting new avenues for us as we move forward. Certainly there's continued opportunity uh, and advocacy to be done around the area of sentencing. Up to this point, the United States Supreme Court has ruled unconstitutional the most extreme sentencing for children, so that's both the death penalty and life without parole. But across the country in state Supreme Courts and a couple of federal courts of appeals, we've seen willingness uh, at the state court level to both eliminate all life without parole sentences for children, so not leaving it as an option in murder cases, but eliminating it entirely under some state constitutional provisions. We've seen state Supreme Courts applying the US Supreme Court's limitations on the mandatory sentence of life without parole to all mandatory sentencing of children uh, who are involved in the justice system. The Washington State Supreme Court is an example of a court that did that uh, relatively recently. We are seeing uh, an openness of courts to examine the conditions that children experience in both juvenile and adult correctional facilities differently. And so courts look at, as I mentioned earlier, the particular vulnerabilities of children, the traumatic histories that so many children have who come into our justice system and how that might affect their placement in solitary confinement. And as a country, we tolerate a significant amount of solitary confinement of adults. We measure it sadly often in years, not even months or weeks. But in the juvenile justice space, we've had more success getting courts to recognize that even a very short period of solitary confinement measured in days or hours can be deeply traumatizing for children. And we have had both some court decisions that have recognized that. And we've also had uh, executive uh, decision making at the federal and state level that has also attempted to curb the use of solitary confinement for children. We're also seeing, um, as we are experiencing widespread interest in criminal justice reform generally in the country, there has been obviously an enormous amount of energy behind that coming both from the right and the left to reform our criminal justice system. A realization that we have far too many people incarcerated in this country a growing recognition that we need to do something about the racism in our justice system. That is all having its own impact in the youth justice space as well. And so we see a lot of innovation in how we are thinking about juvenile probation and parole, for example, 
uh, really limiting the kinds of restrictions that we place on children, understanding that the likelihood of, of teenagers being able to comply with 20 conditions of probation uh, is almost nil, and we're just setting them up for failure. So trying to focus on uh, really a positive frame to focus on their strengths rather than focusing on witness on weaknesses, uh, limiting uh, generally the extent to which children can be incarcerated in facilities, trying to raise the age of children who can be tried as adults. So California is one of the leaders in this where they, through their uh, election process, were able to raise the age at which a child could be even charged as an adult to the age of 16. Prior to two years ago, the law in California was at 14. In many states across the country, the law, the number could be as young as 10, and in some states there's no age at all, particularly for children who might be charged with murder, who could be tried in the adult system. But that's a very robust area of conversation right now, and we see that as another opportunity for where we might see some more reform. And again, it's about pushing that number up. Um, we've seen, finally, uh, almost uniform commitment to raising the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to 18. Um, up until 10 or 15 years ago, there were a number of states across the country that either treated all 17-year-olds automatically as adults. Uh, New York and North Carolina treated 16 and 17-year-olds automatically as adults. All of those laws have now been changed. And we're seeing this, the states across the board keeping at least the opportunity for youth up through their 18th birthday to stay in the juvenile justice system. And then the last um, potential reform area that I'll highlight uh, is, is very much, uh, I think, nascent at this point, but that's also building on the neuroscience in particular that teaches us that youth, uh, that the, the the brains, again, the frontal lobe of the brain continues to develop for not only youth, but emerging adults, young adults into their early to mid twenties. We are now beginning to see some both advocacy and policy being undertaken that is looking to extend the benefits of some of the sentencing reforms and some of the other protections that we've seen for teenagers extended to 18 to 21 year olds, 18 to 25 year olds, some of this is spilling over into the child welfare space as well, which Sue will talk about. Um, but overall, what, what I, would, I would summarize, as I said, I think we're in an era where this recognition that kids are different is driving reform in a way that is looking to provide protection uh, for children from harsh practices in the justice system. At the same time, that we are also trying to ensure that we continue to give youth voice in being able to identify uh, the ways in which our systems don't work for them and participating in coming up with solutions. Um, and I'll wind us up so that then we have plenty of time for questions. So do type your questions in um, and Katie will read them to us. Um, but I just wanted to pick up kind of where Marsha left off in terms of the developmental science and those extensions, <clears throat> pardon me, past age 18. They've been fairly generally accepted um, as the model in the child welfare system, but not universally adopted. And so the federal government allows reimbursement for foster care, <coughs> pardon me, up to age 21. It doesn't end at age 18. About most states have some version of extended foster care, but only half of the states have adopted extended foster care comprehensively. So recognizing that young people at age 18 are not ready to just go off and be independent, but allowing them to stay uh, in foster care with the supports of the child welfare system to age 21. Some wraparound services, they're called Chafee services after Senator Chafee, um, some wraparound services uh, for transition to adulthood that young people can continue to benefit from when they exit the foster care system now up to age 23. So not placement services, but other supportive services. And both education vouchers and Medicaid are available to children who exit the foster care system up to age 26. And so in this particular area, the child welfare system is really leading um, the, the field in recognizing the developmental um, science and the needs of 
um, emerging adults past their 18th birthday. Um, there's nothing magic about 18 except it's written into law. Um, their needs up to age, as I say, 26 for support with education and with Medicaid. There's growing um, calls to end congregate care, sort of what you might think of as large institutional placements uh, in the child welfare system. And the recently passed Family First Act limits congregate care to two weeks. Um, and there's a couple of exceptions for, for um, pregnant and parenting teens and for young people at risk of sex trafficking. And there's concern that the exceptions could swallow the rule. Um, but uh, there is definitely a value embedded within the Family First Act um, to move away from congregate care in the child welfare system, recognizing that children do best um, with their families or at least within their communities. There's a increasing um, demand for family-based services. Those have been funded um, since 1980, but they've never been an unlimited source of funding. So Foster care is an entitlement. However much a state provides, the federal government reimburses at the federal state match. But uh, so, uh, preventive services and in-home services are based on funding limits and they're capped services. And so the, uh, the, um, there's a, a call to make uh, more of those needs-based services a right or an entitlement. And the Family First Act begins to move in that direction, um, but it has fairly strict limitations um, on when uh, those sorts of services are, are offered in an open-handed way and to all, all um, children, not just those who meet the income eligibility that I talked about earlier tied to the old um, AFDC eligibility rules. Um, there's also a lot of um, movement within the child welfare system to recognize the important relationships that children have that will anchor them as they transition from the foster care system, even if those relationships extend beyond um, their parents and their biological families. And so recognizing the importance of sibling relationships when placement decisions and movement um, questions are being entertained by the system, of extended family, however the child might define that. So aunties and uncles who may not be blood relations, but are significant adults in a young person's life, um, coaches, teachers, people who may provide supports to them, and the sort of move between the important need that children have for these supportive relationships to making some sort of state support for those relationships an entitlement or a right. So I think we're going to wind up here for now and see what questions you have. Um, and we can then keep the conversation going based on your specific requests. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be uh, looking here through the questions. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to just submit it in the question box. And here we have one. I know you mentioned California showing positive changes, uh, such as making the minimum age to charge minors as adults. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at this. 16 compared to, say, 14. What are some of the states and examples that are leading the way when it comes to juvenile justice and law? Are, are there states that you've seen regressing, and, and if so, how? Um, that's a great uh, question. That's a great question. Uh, and definitely, uh, definitely. We're getting an echo. We're getting an echo. Yeah, we're getting an echo, Katie. Maybe you need to. Sh I'm muting. Okay. okay. Um, California has been a leader, and interestingly, California was a laggard. Um, California was one of the states that really jumped very quickly um, onto the right turn coming off of the 90s and had changed their transfer laws uh, to make it much easier to try kids as adults. And here we see this complete turnaround where they're really leading the nation, I think, in raising the age to 16. Uh, I should note that that law has been challenged. It was a referendum. It has been challenged by uh, prosecutors in California, although so far uh, my understanding is that the advocates have won uh, in the courts. I don't think it's gone before the, before the California Supreme Court yet. Um, I think that some of the other big changes that we've seen really does have to do with this raising the age uh, 
So I mentioned that New York and North Carolina were two states that had treated all 16 and 17 year olds as adults. So you could be charged with trespassing or shoplifting and you would be tried in the adult criminal justice system. Uh, they have both now changed their laws, both of them within the last couple of years. Uh, and a number of states like Michigan, Connecticut, uh, Missouri, who all had 17 as their juvenile upper age limit for juvenile court jurisdiction, have now raised it to 18. I think one of the innovative uh, conversations that we're seeing going on now is actually raising juvenile court jurisdiction above age 18. So hasn't happened yet, but in Connecticut and Massachusetts, there has been some leadership and there has been real conversation at the legislative and executive level about possibly raising the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to 18 or 19. So that would mean that individuals 18 and 19 who were charged with criminal conduct would actually be tried in the juvenile justice system. Um, and that would be quite, quite a radical shift, certainly historically for this country. Um, so that's a couple of examples of the kinds of reforms that we're seeing. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, I, I had the pleasure of serving on a National Academies of Sciences Committee and we issued our report which you can find online. It's called The Promise of Adolescence, Realizing Opportunity for All Youth. And within that report, it's actually on page 303 of the report, is a list of state level legislation uh, which relied upon developmental science in the legislative history um, to revise the juvenile justice system. And it includes all the things that Marcia said, um, uh, but it, you know, just a couple more examples, um, uh, states which have revised their juvenile sex offender registration laws, um, states which have eliminated or eliminated the use of shackles, um, states that have um, eliminated the ability of law enforcement to advise youth to waive their right to counsel, um, creation of special facilities uh, for youth up to age 21, that sort of bridge between the juvenile justice and the adult correctional system. So there's, you know, a three page list um, of state legislation. Um, and again, that's in the National Academies of Sciences um, report, The Promise of Adolescence. And if any of you can't find it and want me to send it to you, you can just um, make that request to me here at Juvenile Law Center and I can send it to you. We have another question. Um, the best way for reporters to know about the problems to advances in juvenile justice is to be in the courtroom. Any law or rule changes coming up that might allow better access for journalists? Huh. That's a great question too. Um, and it's a hard one because if anything, and mostly we think this is a good thing, We've seen a reversion um, for state juvenile justice systems to provide more confidentiality, greater opportunities for expungement, greater opportunities for sealing of juvenile records and to limit access. Um, you know, we're of two minds on this. Juvenile Law Center was very involved in the Kids for Cash, Luzerne County Juvenile Court Judges scandal, which really unfolded over five years because it was a secret system that nobody had access to and people couldn't see what was going on behind doors. Um, and so we, we are very supportive of transparency and accountability. And I think the challenge is how to provide access to journalists. And there are some jurisdictions that do this well. I think that in Miami, for example, uh, I believe that the juvenile court there does provide access with strict limitations on the kinds of information that journalists can report on, but it at least allows eyes on the system, which is incredibly important. Um, so I would say that it is a continually evolving uh, question that, as I said, we, we fully support transparency and accountability um, and are constantly struggling with how to achieve that while also protecting confidentiality of children's involvement in the justice system. We have another question here. Where do you think the final goal of fairness to juveniles is? Have we met it? Are we close to meeting full juvenile rights? Well, I'll speak on the justice side and Sue can speak on the child welfare side. On the justice side, no. Again, I think that because we're um, in the midst of such a uh, really very engaged conversation about justice reform generally in this country, um, while I do think that the US Supreme Court uh, 
would not be the first place I would go to continue to push the envelope. I think that there will be interest at state policy and executive levels. I think at state Supreme Court, state appellate court levels. Um, I do think that we have opened the door and I don't see it closing quickly in terms of opportunities that still lie ahead for children who are involved in the justice system uh, to really change what has been a very punitive framework for the last few decades to one that is much more geared toward rehabilitation and second chances. And I would say in the child, on the child welfare side um, that uh, the laws are pretty good, I think advocates generally think, but the implementation and the funding for those laws um, is consistently um, problematic. And so although kids may have a right to services in their own home, there's not enough of those services, um, although they may have a right to extended foster care, um, if they're arrested in all but three states, they lose their right to extended foster care. The extended foster care may be set up in such a way that it's so unattractive to the young teenagers who sort of want their freedom that they choose to walk out the door. Um, and so the, and, and in many instances, the mandates aren't individually enforceable. And so if the, if the state or local jurisdiction um, fails to meet the mandates um, despite receipt of federal law, the remedy is to limit the federal reimbursement as opposed to give the rights or give the uh, the services to the child. And so it's a it's a complicated um, system to litigate. Um, it's a complicated crisis oriented system to run at the state and local levels. Um, the, the, the federal laws are pretty good and have been responsive over time to, to both the latest science and the latest advocacy, but the implementation um, remains very problematic. Um, and I guess the other thing I would mention is that many of the arguments and rights um, in the child welfare system um, could extend to the immigration system. So the, the separation from families issues, all the things that have been recognized in the child welfare system as important um, could be extended into the immigration system. Um, some have, most have not. Um, and so, you know, the notion of rights, children's rights in state care or, you know, in the custody of, the pub, of, a, of a public agency here in the United States very much depends on which system you enter. They're perhaps most strongly legislated in the child welfare system, most strongly litigated in the juvenile justice system, most ill-defined in the immigration system, um, and uh, the mental health system is somewhere in between the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. We have another question here. To what degree does the federal government fund in-home services and preventive services versus the entitlement for foster care placements? Um, and so the federal government provides um, capped funding each year for those parts of the law um, which are um, non-mandatory. And now the only entitlements are adoption assistance, foster care, and certain forms of independent living funding. So for the most part, all the um, in-home services are kind of as money allows and even though the federal government may provide funding that hasn't been, the cap hasn't been reached by the state and locality, there is always a state and local match. And so sometimes those in-home services, because the state and local match isn't as generous as it is for foster care, the foster care match is based on the Medicaid match, the, um, because it's not as generous a match, um, the the state and local governments can't afford uh, their percentage. Um, and so it's consistently been the case that the sort of go-to service is placement, even if the laws have changed to reflect um, a, a value that states that it should be in-home services. Um, there's a disincentive or there's an incentive, toward, there's a disincentive to provide those services because it costs more at the state and local level and there's an incentive to provide um, foster care because it's an unlim unlimited reimbursement. Um, so that 
is the end of the questions. I don't know if anyone has a final question, um, but we will be also posting the video to our YouTube channel of this uh, session uh, and uh, sending it out for all of you. Um, thank you so much to everyone who participated. Uh, this is part of a series. This is the third of a series of uh, phone calls we've conducted for reporters. So if you're interested also in suggesting a topic that you think would be of interest to the field, uh, please uh, consider sending me that note. You can email press at jlc.org. Um, and we're here to be a resource for you. Thank you so much for participating. Seeing no more questions, I think we'll uh, sign out. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for you. participating. Thanks for participating.